I just want to again introduce myself. I'm John Wayne McMahon, one of the pastors at Marvin and lead pastor in CORE. It's good to be with you. If you're new or visiting or if you're joining us online, either live or throughout this week, thank you for trusting us with your time. I'm especially excited today for All Saints Day. This is my, as I was sharing this morning, is my favorite stretch of the liturgical year. A lot of people think contemporary church doesn't do anything liturgical, and that's just hogwash, okay? Uh, we have a church calendar that uh, anchors us to our belief that points us in healthy directions. And part of that is All Saints Day today. I'm excited for Christ the King Sunday in a couple of weeks as we prepare for Advent as well. But All Saints Day is one of my favorites because uh, it gives us, um, not only does it invite us in a place of celebrating those that have gone on before us, but it also brings a source of inspiration and points us to Christ in important ways as we'll talk about today. But let's jump to scripture. Philippians chapter three, we're starting in verse four. Hear the word of the Lord. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks again for your presence with us, and I pray that you would add your blessing to the reading of this scripture, your holy word. Where we are empty, would you fill us? Where we are weak, would you strengthen us? Where we are wrong, would you correct us and would you send us out once more? And God, I pray for myself that you'd speak through me or in spite of me, but may it be your message that's delivered. We love you and trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say, amen. Well, in the words of the late Dr. Ellsworth Callis, the good news is today is All Saints Day, an important and beautiful part of the Christian year. The bad news is I have to convince some of us that's important. If I were to be honest, if you were to be honest today, I would assume that some of us, a lot of us maybe, didn't know it was All Saints Day till we walked in the building. And that's okay, but that's the task before your preacher today. But now, in a time that we're in, a season of life that we're in, with the pandemic, and for any of us that have lost loved ones or been close to losing loved ones or been close to someone who's lost loved ones, our senses are heightened a little at this Christian celebration because in many ways, we've, been having, we've had to face the reality of death in different ways. And so All Saints Day and remembering those that have gone on before us, maybe if there was ever a time your awareness might be heightened, even if you didn't know it was All Saints until you got in the room. But this is where we are today as we celebrate All Saints Day. And I I just want to give you a little history of All Saints because it has a wider scope. All Saints Day really started, the observance started um, in the late fourth century. So we're talking about the 300s, originally set aside to first honor Christian martyrs, those that gave up their life for their faith, that withstood persecution and were killed for following Jesus. And then usually the day after we would honor those that are non-canonized, meaning outside the Bible, those honor those that had given up their life or had gone on before us 
as the all the faithful departed all souls day. And so martyrs on one day and then everyone else on the next day. But in the Protestant movement, which we are in the Protestant movement, we hold those things together for all saints day. So the first Sunday after November 1st is all saints day where we, we worship and acknowledge the martyrs, those that have gone before us. And specifically, we will later read names of those in our own community that have gone on to glory in the previous year. And so considering all those things, I thought in our time together, I might share some stories of saints with you so that we might understand why All Saints Sunday is important. The first one I wanna start with came from my experience this week. I was in Dayton, Ohio for some doctoral studies work and our focus of study this week was the Apostolic Fathers which are some of the leaders, the earliest writings that we have outside of the New Testament. And so the first one that we learned about this week was Bishop Ignatius. Bishop Ignatius was a bishop in Antioch of Syria. And in the 90s, I'm not talking about 1990s, I'm talking about the 90s, in the mid 90s of the first century, he was arrested for being a leader in the church and he was taken from Syria up to Rome where he was eventually fed to animals in front of a cheering mob because he was a Christian. And on the way, this saint was not overcome with fear, but he spent his last days encouraging the Christians from Syria all the way to Rome by writing letters and receiving anyone that would come with the Roman soldiers and, and these, uh, these prisoners, Christian prisoners, they would have visitors along the road and he would encourage them and share faith with them. And he wrote these letters to encourage them in the face of persecution and to teach faith to them. And I wanna share a quote from you. He wrote this. I'm not commanding you as though I were somebody important. For even though I am in chains for the sake of the name, that being Jesus, I have not yet been perfected in Jesus Christ. For now I am only beginning to be a disciple and I speak to you as my fellow students. This humble leader, and he is very humble because he's been leading as a bishop for years now. On his way to death, he says, I'm but a student like you. Press on to all that is Christ. One of the people he's writing to in the final days is a man named Polycarp, another bishop, one who was protector of the faith in Smyrna. And he would serve as bishop. Bishops are a lot different than the bishops that we experience now. They were there to teach the faith, to pastor, to defend the faith, and to help encourage churches as they go. And he would serve as a bishop in this persecuting time for probably up to 60 years until he was 86 years old and he was arrested by the Romans and he was taken to his death where instead of being fed to animals, he would be burned in front of everyone that was watching a cheering mob. And as his day would come, what I love about Polycarp is that those that would write about the martyrdom of Polycarp, which by the way is the earliest witness of a martyrdom outside of the New Testament. And so this is happening in the mid, early, maybe mid second century. But those that wrote about Polycarp giving up his life, they actually wrote about it like it was Christ's sacrifice because the Polycarp was so Christ-like in his final days that they actually saw Jesus in the life of Polycarp. And so they shared these stories that would remind you of Jesus's giving up of himself. The night when he's arrested, he goes into a garden and he prays, not my will, but your will. And when it comes time for him to denounce his faith in front of everyone, they challenge him and he says, listen, I'm not turning my back on who has never turned the, his back on me, speaking of God and Jesus Christ. And they said, okay, Polycarp, well, now you've met your fate. And as they come to nail him to that which is going to burn, this is what he says. Leave me as I am, for he who enables me to endure the fire will also enable me to remain on the pier without moving, even without the sense of security which you get from the nails. And in his last moments in front of all of these people, he prays this prayer. O oh Lord God Almighty, Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received knowledge of you, the God of angels and powers of all creation and of the whole race of the righteous who, you, who live in your presence. I bless you because you've considered me worthy of this day and hour, that I might receive a place among the number of martyrs in the cup of your Christ. 
to the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and of body in the incorruptibility of the Holy Spirit. May I be received among them in your presence today as a rich and acceptable sacrifice as you have prepared and revealed beforehand and now have accomplished. You who are the undeceiving and true God, for this reason, indeed for all things, I praise you, I bless you, I glorify you through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, your beloved son, through whom to you with him and the Holy Spirit be glory both now and for the ages to come. Amen. In his last moments, it is said that even the Romans would turn and say things like we heard with Jesus, surely this man is of God. Surely he follows the one living God. And we could share stories and stories of ancient martyrs, but there's also contemporary examples as well. We could talk about Martin Luther, the great reformer that would risk everything in his life because he knew that the church had gone astray, that people were not being led in the way of Christ and given proper access to the free gift of Jesus Christ. Instead, they were being told that they had to earn their way or they had to go through a priest or they had to do certain exercises to receive the free gift of of Jesus. So Martin Luther lays down everything with holy discontent for the way things were so that God would bring renewal in the church. And we stand on those shoulders today. Or another reformer that comes after Martin Luther, more familiar to us as Methodist, John Wesley, the, for, the founder of the Methodist movement. By the way, he was called a Methodist, not in a nice way. When he was starting out his journey, his little accountability group, they took seriously what it meant to live Christian lives, that they met for all hours of the day, praying and studying what the Christian life would be look like. And they gave them a derogatory term, oh, there are the Methodists, because they're so worried about their method. John Wesley did not rest until he knew what it meant to walk in the spirit. And when God sent him out into the world, he took faith to the people. He brought renewal throughout the, the uh, coal mines and in the bars and to the common people because they had been shut out of the church in many different ways. This Wesley believed that the Holy Spirit could we could experience the spirit in our lives so that we might know faith, hope, and love, that our lives would be different. He believed that God doesn't just forgive us of our sins, but sets us free for, from sin so that we might walk in freedom. And so he got up at four o'clock every morning and he rode around on horseback and he spent all hours of the day trying to share the faith. And I love this prayer that he would later give on to his pastors for a covenant service where he says, Lord, I am no longer my own, but I'm yours. Put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low by you. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours, so be it, amen. Have you ever heard the story about William Seymour? He's a one-eyed pastor, preacher that came from Louisiana. And when he was in Texas, he was, in, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit in a holy uh, movement church that was here in Texas and then sent out to California to begin to preach the good news. And when he got out there, he began to get shut out of churches because he was an African-American and this was the Jim Crow South. And when he was locked out of churches, he still kept preaching. And as he preached, at first it was only African-Americans, and then it was this beautiful cross-cultural movement of the Holy Spirit that brought healing and brought uh, miracles. And from that place, the Azusa Street revivals, Pentecostalism was born in our country and throughout the world. Missionaries would go from this little prayer meeting and be sent out into the world. But let me remind you, this was a black preacher in the Jim Crow South. I wanna share a quote with you about what the Los Angeles Times said about William Seymour in this movement. They denounced it as, quote, disgraceful intermingling of the races. The article pointed an accusing finger at members because, quote, the cry and make, they cry and make howling noises all day and into the night. It ridiculed attendees as mad, mentally deranged, or under a spell, and it insulted Seymour as a one-eyed, illiterate inward who stays on his knees much of the time with his head hidden between the wooden milk crates. 
You know what it was referencing with the milk crates is Seymour, he would enter into the night of worship and prayer meetings and what he would do is he would put his head in a box. It was a weird, odd thing that what he would do. But what he wanted to do was not be a distraction from what God was doing in the, in the room. So as a leader, he would hide himself and he would stay there until he felt God had released him to come out and preach the good news. The LA Times made fun of him, but a leader that was watching him said, I've never seen such power come from such a humble man, a saint of the church, someone who risked all so that church could find renewal. And we could give example after example. We could talk about Mother Teresa. We could talk about these other historical figures. This morning, I'm reflecting on ones that fall even close to home for me. A few weeks ago, we lost one of the great scholars of our day. His name was Dr. Billy Abraham. He was a professor and teacher at SMU Perkins in Dallas. And recently at Baylor, he was starting a Wesley house there. He had been writing for decades on evangelism and the Wesleyan movement. And, and he's contributed in ways that I, I don't think we'll know for decades as far as academically. But what we've learned even recently is the biggest contribution he's made is to giving himself to his students. And his students are now my teachers. And there's testimony after testimony of this man giving his life for his faith. Or even closer to home, this year I lost an Aunt Patsy. Maybe you lost someone in your life that was near and dear to you as well. I was reflecting this week and my cousin, uh, a cousin of mine was reflecting as well on what Patsy meant to our family. And my cousin wrote this, Patsy was the center of gravity in our family. She was the convener. She taught us yoga, well, some of us. She snuck us desserts and hung out with us in the lake treading water when we were kids. She delighted in our successes and loved us through failures as we grew. See friends, the saints sometimes give their life and place on earth for the sake of us and for the sake of Christ. But all of the saints are known for pouring out their lives as an offering for others and never settling for mediocre, never settling for isolation, never settling with just getting by, but pressing into the place that few will go so that Christ may be known and the church might know renewal. And that's what brings us back to Paul. He shows us the stuff of saints. Yes, he's a martyr, but it is not necessarily what that which makes him a saint because he died, or at least that's not the only reason. He says to the Philippians some things that I think frame his life as a saint for us and a saint for us to celebrate on All Saints Day. First, he says sainthood is not about worldly achievement because if success or prowess or education or titles or anything of this world was the measuring stick, Paul said, I would be confident and I could boast in that because I had it all. Look at what he says in four verses four and six. Though I myself, I have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I was beating up the bad guys. That's what Paul Paul's saying, if you wanted the resume, I had it, but I don't boast in this anymore because that's not what it's about. He says, no, saintliness is about the uninhibited pursuit of Christ above all things. This is why Paul says, I consider all of that, that resume, I consider it loss. I consider it garbage if it's not for me knowing Christ. It is about the restlessness knowing that we are not quite fully who we are called to be. And Paul exhibited that with everything that he has. Saintliness is about having an imagination to see what most cannot and to, to, to desire more of heaven to be here on earth. The saints show us, Siri, shut up. The saints show us a holy discontent to not stop until the fullness of Christ is their experience. That's why Paul says in verse 12, not that I've already obtained it. Y'all, this is, sorry, stop dead. it. <laughs> Saints and Siri sounds the same, I guess, apparently. That's why Paul says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. This is the apostle Paul writing from prison who will face death eventually. He says, I'm not even there yet, but that's not stopping me. I'm gonna press on. 
I'm gonna get there. Why do we give thanks for the saints today? Because when the world seems to spiral, they go about this pursuit of becoming the city on the hill, the leaven that makes the bread rise, the salt of the earth. And y'all, I don't know about you, but of all the times of our lifetime, I think now is a good time to need the saints. When we face hopelessness and fear and political strife and systemic injustice and entertainment and technology and secularism and individualism and the church in the West at least is full of people that don't have any distinguishing marks of the Christian faith. They look just like the world around them. In the midst of that, we need the saints. We need the saints and thank God for them who swim upstream, who fervently pursue Jesus and thereby show us the way, who pour out themselves as an offering to the church and the world. And lest you would think this is only for the saintly or the Bible heroes or the once in a lifetime persons, no brothers and sisters, this is a calling for all of us. That's why scripture says, you are the saints for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so maybe the burning question for us today is how many of us will start to swim upstream? How many of us will press into all that Christ is so that the world might see Christ? Back to Dr. Callis, he says it this way, and I love it for us today. In the dark, hopeless streets where death and ugliness reign, a Mother Teresa walks. Christian lay people go each week into prison compounds to lead Bible studies and to listen to sometimes lonely, sometimes angry souls. Devout Catholics go each morning to their mass and devout Protestants open their Bible each day to read and pray. Such meaningless acts, some would say. Nothing like the power brokering on Wall Street or the clever manipulating in the entertainment industry. Ha, ha. Well, while all these are parading their power in New York, Washington, and Los Angeles, the saints are going to their morning prayers where they hold back the very powers of hell. Friends, there's not 10 steps to sainthood that I can share with you today. I can't give you a few bullet points of this is how we get there. Paul in his 50s on the way to lay down his life says, I'm not there yet. Myself before you today, I'm barely scratching the surface and have a long way to go. It is a long and difficult journey, but it is a magnificent one and it's one that we desperately need again in our day. And wouldn't today be the perfect day to begin that journey? All Saints Day. As remember those who have pointed us to the way and have gone faithfully in that direction. I thank God for the saints. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let God's people say, amen. I wanna invite you to stand as we respond in how we believe by saying the Apostles' Creed. You can stand. The words will be on the screen. This points our direction. It shapes our worship, but it's also a way for us to respond as a congregation. Let's say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.